you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue the Law by Night How to Vampire series, a mini-series that aims to improve the role-playing of players and storytellers during tabletop sessions. This episode will focus on portraying the titles of the Camarilla. If you are a player of Vampire the Masquerade, you have all played a Camarilla game. Pretty much every actual player you'll find online has players dumped in a Camarilla domain, toughing it out in political battlefields trying to fuck over each other and the various titles that rule over them. Sometimes, a player may be handed a title by the storyteller for one reason or another, and they are suddenly thrust into a whole new world of responsibility and have no idea what they're supposed to do with it. Whilst this is usually an exciting, scary process from both the perspective of a storyteller and a player. It can lead to some frustration if neither party fully understands the role. Newer players may also struggle with the whole Camarilla aesthetic and want a bit more information than what is provided in the core books and slash or ST. There are many ways of portraying these roles and setting, as well as just the average Camarilla member. However, you are not here for just anyone's opinion. You came here for mine, and that is exactly what I intend to deliver, in the hope that some of what I may say will be able to enhance your sessions. All thoughts and opinions are my own, so if you disagree with something I have said, that is totally fine. It does not mean that you are right and I am wrong and vice versa. I will begin by repeating things I have said in the previous episodes of this series, which are how to make awesome and believable characters for creating the core character concept, as well as how to portray elders which may or may not help you with individual roles such as Prince, Primogen, etc, etc. I suggest you listen to those before you carry on listening to this episode if you haven't done already. It is also worth listening to my podcast episode about the Ivory Tower, as that will give you all that you need to know about their origins and a basic breakdown of those different and roles found within the sect. On the topic of the sects, let us start with the most important title that every Camarilla game will have at some point, which is the Prince. They rule cities. The will of the city is the will of the Prince. They are the elder that have successfully claimed praxis, with the approval of the Justicars, to rule all within the city and to dictate how the tradition should be interpreted. Your haven and domains within the city belong to the Prince. In an ideal city, the power of the prince is balanced by the Primogen, who represent each clan belonging to the Camarilla. It was intended that they were heavily involved with the domain's politics rather than just being the eldest and most powerful member of their represented clan. As the eldest rule, they are often not elected by the prince. The first Primogen council would have been elected by a prince and your city may do this as well. This was all the idea upon the conceptualization. They can overthrow a prince if they start spouting nonsense or if they become weird dictating bastards, the prince I mean. A primogen can force a prince to recognize a vote on something of particular importance, which is usually done in Elysium and practiced sparingly, lest they wish to have their title removed for abusing said power. The power the Primogen Council govern is a collective power. Each individual Primogen, however, may appoint a whip to be a second in command of sorts, which is more likely roles for player characters to fall into because they have very little power within a domain and thus deal with things the Primogen do not wish to do for such things are beneath them. To get the attention of the whip gets the attention of the Primogen. Assuming your Chronicle bothers having one, of course. All this being said, many a prince rule their domain through fear, and there are many ways one can do that. A mad dictator may kill anyone who so much looks at them the wrong way. They could cultivate many child that could oppose the primogen that way. Whether through fear or sane choice making, the prince can only rule with the continued support of his or her people, whilst it is the role of the primogen to support their prince and act as a voice for their people, which are the clan they represent. It does mean some extensive knowledge regarding the clan in question is important, not necessarily the clan law, but more the clan's function within the city, the politics, the hierarchies, the relationships they have with the other clans in the domain, etc, etc. Harpies are the constant reminders to the prince and primogen that they are on the same said side, not with threats or dictation, for the most part, but through the constant reminder of pre-station with their social tongue. What is pre-station? It is the boon system that essentially boils down to, I'll scratch your back, 
you'll scratch mine. Sometimes they are known as the Herald, which can act as a more formal harpy, becoming the voice of the prince, often exchanging news with other heralds in other Camarilla cities. In short, they protect the hierarchy, existing only for the prince. Some formal domains have a chancellor to keep tabs on who owes who what and reads them out at every Elysium, which is overseen by the Keeper of Elysium, which is an honorific title that is appointed by the prince. The Keeper's power is very narrow as their only role is to be the host and security within Elysium. Beyond this, they are just another kindred. The title can be used as a way of keeping someone in line, forcing them to abide by camera rules such as Julia Sawinski of the visual novel Shadows of New York. Harpies and Keepers should work together to know everything that is happening in the city. They need favours too, in addition to their representation of the Prince. But let us hypothesise that the Harpy has failed and the Primogen attempt to kill the Prince and overthrow them and fail. They, the Council, have declared war on the Prince and should be officially removed. The ones who can officially remove them are the Justicars. They can also overrule any Prince, so the power they wield is immense. They are also the only ones who can permanently eliminate a Prince from their position. A failed Prince is a dead Prince in this case. Otherwise, they are an Autarchus Elder in exile who won't be treated seriously by any Archon, the Justicars lackeys. Like the Justicars above them, the Archons are immune to the traditions, acting as a physical last chance to clean this shit up before the Justicar is summoned. For the sake of completion, Alistairs are like the Archons but only hunt those who commit diablery. The topic of law enforcement brings forth a couple of other roles. The Scourge should be more prominent in V5 lore simply because of the increased number of Finbloods and Kaitiv they must deal with. The elimination of such is their most common role but they can hunt after those who break the tradition of hospitality in addition to any unruly Anarchs that cause a fuss. It may appear to be a role not holding a lot of power. Now this is true in a political sense but there is a lot of fear surrounding the role and as I have mentioned already, fear is a weapon in of itself. The sheriff roles can be summarised with two tasks. They protect the city against itself and locate and punish lawbreakers. For minor offences, the sheriff is more a judge and jailer and possibly executioner. For grander crimes, they deliver said kindred to the prince. They are ruthless and wield a merciless authority, as the name would declare. As such, they have to be quick-witted. Sometimes they share that role with the Seneschal, otherwise known as Chief of Intelligence, one acting as the brains, the other as the muscle. Sheriffs have their own second-in-commands, usually known as Hounds, but occasionally they are called Deputies. And what is a Seneschal exactly? Well, in short, a weird blend between right-hand agent and secretary to the Prince with some having more power than others. Some domains have them as a trusted aide who Kindred can speak to in order to request a meeting with the Prince. The Seneschal, of course, can deny such requests if they believe it is a trivial matter to the Prince to deal with or the inverse. They know the Prince better than anyone else, which probably means they are as old as the Prince themselves or perhaps a pinch younger. Some may have equal power to their Prince also. The difference between Seneschal and Prince is that the Seneschal governs and are thus the main political figure. They are often groomed by the Primogen Council to be the next Prince. The Prince, however, is the judge, jury and executioner. It is my honest opinion that a Prince should be feared. It is fine to fuck up in front of the Seneschal, they are the approachable ones. To an extent. The Prince? Never. The Camarilla is not a democratic society, but one that is truly dictated by age, experience and power. It exists for the benefit of the status quo. Those who have the power to keep it and those that don't have it do not deserve it. As stated in this episode, your character's introduction into the sect is tied to it. The Camarilla is a social club. That's no bastardization either. It consists of like-minded individuals that agree survival is paramount through the upholding of their traditions, the first of which, the Masquerade, is at the very core of the sect. It protects vampires from other diabolical diabolizing kindred and more mundane and supernatural foes. It also protects the livestock in which you feed upon, the mortals, from knowing of your existence, alerting the likes of hunters that can kill you. In short, it is the only tradition that is not open for interpretation. Breaking this one is the most frequent way vampires are killed. You may think that as a player this is easy to circumvent, 
puncture marks heal with your magic saliva, or you can hide an accidental killing by breaking their neck, for example. The police aren't going to know it was you, right? Right? No, but your authorities have eyes and ears everywhere, and that news will go back to them. The status quo I mentioned has been broken, and now the elders are shitting themselves because someone has broken the masquerade. If one kindred can be sloppy, then so can ten others. Then problems happen. If you, the player, realise has been sloppy and are unable to gain access to police records, the morgue, etc., this is where you call priest station to someone who can help. Then you pray that it's the first they've heard about it, because that person you're probably going to ask is the sheriff. Otherwise, you will get a pretty nasty punishment. Providing you're not dead, you offer a boon, or your sire does, as stated in the accounting tradition. Now, if the player is the sheriff, you now have a lot of work to do so you don't fuck up and piss off the prince. A good sire would teach their child the do's and don'ts of the vampire world, which is where the tradition of progeny would enter, which is far more than just being able to create and manage more vampires. It is closely tied to hospitality, where the sire would show you off and take you everywhere, like a toddler or a prize pony, as you are introduced to all in Elysium. As a fledgling vampire, you would do well not to say a word unless you're given explicit permission. Your naivete will only bring shame to your sire. Hospitality also applies to travelling kindred. You turn up in a wagon to a new city and you have to introduce yourself to the prince, but only after letting them know in advance, according to some books. This means your character has to have some sort of contact in the city to get you in. Regardless, I would advise players to do this anyway. Remember who and what you're dealing with here. A figure of authority by the title of Prince, who can kill you on the spot. You're not on a night out of your buddies having a cheeky Nando's. Whilst the courts of each Camarilla domain may be different, the arrogant etiquette you are expected to respect remains absolute. You now have an expanded lore by night description of most of the Camarilla roles that I believe are most common in Camarilla games, with the exception of the Justicar, their superior and their subsidiaries. You have been educated a bit more on most of the traditions and how the fledgling should behave with all of them, but how does your character fit into this? I ask that because the richness of this game comes from investing time into your character, their goals and how they will fuck with the opposition just by existing. I address this in my How to Make Awesome and Believable Characters episode and every character creation tutorial episode I have ever done because you should be asking yourself every possible question to not only make them fit into your chronicle but to make them a believable person. Don't think about the dots on the character sheet as the dots and expressions of their powers. They are extensions of the character. A good ST will look at your sheet and know what sort of person they are and whether they match up with whatever concept you have given them. But what about the STs themselves? How does one make those camera titles more interesting in your games? Just like I said in the How to Make Awesome and Believable Characters episode, why not change things up a little bit? Not every harpy has to be a Torador and every prince has to be a Ventru. Yes, many of the canonical princes usually are Ventru, but only a small portion of the world has been covered by the official books. Even so, you don't have to adhere to that. The sheriffs, hounds and the other hunting titles don't have to be given to the more violent clans such as the Gangrel, Bruja and Banu Hakim or the Asamites, assuming that we are using the V5 system where the Asamites are now part of the Ivory Tower. Sure, you can use your knowledge of clan lore to help you define a character for a given title, but don't solely think about the clans and their powers, the crunch so to speak. They do not speak to who and what the person is. How about I provide an example? Let us try and fashion the Tremere into these Camarilla titles. Why them? Well, because it is the stereotype to assume they are not interested in Camarilla politics, only the politics of their own clan and the infamous pyramid structure. This is true, but the prestige and the authority governed by the Camarilla ranks could potentially allow them greater access to blood magic. After all, the Tremere are a Camarilla clan and not an independent one. The Camarilla always has dominance over the Warlocks, much to their dissatisfaction. Besides that, I would suspect a Tremere prince is only ever called upon under great emergency or because the pyramid demands one. A warlock prince, fortified by the magic of an entire clan, is one that controls their domain with fear, as few outside House Tremere understand the true powers of formaturgy unless the prince is foolish enough to openly practice their powers. You can't guess the infinite possibilities of magic now, can you? Likewise, a Tremere Harpy has access to many a unique ritual to force others to comply with priestation, whether the kindred in question is supposed to or not. 
A Tremere Seneschal would be a pleasant niche for the clan. They have the protection of blood magic, while some have greater influence over the domain being able to employ an array of rituals and sorceries to do so. A warlock assigned to the sheriff can employ fear on the other end. If you allow me to be a bit more barbaric, a Tremere Scourge is terrifying to think about, as they could provide new test subjects for the clan think about it. Few care for the Kaitif and Finnbloods, and the Camarilla have no interest in the Anarch, so who would get upset if they suddenly go… missing? Tremere Archons, however, I would imagine being less common, as they act outside of the Camarilla and Council 7 directly, so I suspect that will debate whether their loyalty to their imposing Justicar overlords is greater to that of the clan. I wouldn't have thought so, so any Archons would have to play a fine balancing act to please both parties. And if that doesn't sound daft to you, as of V5, Ian Carfax is the Tremere Justicar, previously Archon to Carl Schrecht, who was the previous Justicar for the clan. But to bring things back around, his sire was the Prince of Vienna, a man called Lefarius. After hearing me ramble for well over 10 minutes, it is possible that you feel disheartened by what I have told you and how seemingly impossible it is to easily achieve power in a Camarilla game. Well fucking done. The system of the Camarilla is designed to keep you in your place as it continues to shit on everything you do, not overtly mind you, but with grace and subtlety. You are part of a large royal family, with each member trying to get a slice of that power pie. Rather than kings and queens, you have princes. You do not have to be as big and powerful as they are to be deemed a force to be reckoned with, however. You can easily have kindred bow and quiver to you with respect or with fear. Just know it will take a while for you to get that with the kindred in Elysium. To end this episode I want to reiterate two things. First of all, everything I've just presented to you is my own opinion. At the end of the day, you can do whatever you want. As long as everyone is having fun and feeling that political horror, you are interpreting it correctly. The other thing I wish to reinforce is that I have only presented a mere portion of my knowledge and takes on tonight's topic. Why would I give you all of my secrets? Trick question? I fucking wouldn't. I can reveal, however, that all my knowledge comes from the book, so go and read them if you want to learn more. Again, it is not needed to enjoy the game, but if you want to develop your character concept within the grand lore, go and legally purchase the books and read them. I would have fun doing so as well. To be kept updated, follow the Lore by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you will be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.